We have uh, Gloria Edwards today as part of um, our webinar series. So this is um, kind of a joint effort between um, State Colorado State Forest Service, CSU Extension, and um, an part of our initiative to do more joint projects through the CSU Natural Resource Partners Group. Uh, and so just a little background on Gloria. Uh, Gloria is the program coordinator for the Southern Rockies Fire Science Network with Colorado State University. Um, she has a background in archaeology and botany. She has uh, experience in forest management, fuels mitigation, um, has done work in the private sector as well as on five national forests, and has uh, brief experience in wildland firefighting as well. Huge thank you to Jamie Dahl and the Colorado State Forest Service and Extension for working with me and helping to put this together. This is great to be able to talk to you. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy afternoons to find out more about us. And at the end of this presentation, I look forward to um, having a great working relationship with all of you going forward. So as you can see on our title slide, we are presenting the Southern Rockies Fire Science Network. And I know that's a mouthful, but the most important part of that is the word network. Um, all political thoughts aside, I always kind of like to say it takes a lot of villages to raise wildfire knowledge. And I'm sure there's a lot of you out there that know what I mean about that. Um, so moving along, uh, we are part of the Joint Fire Science Program, which is a national program that was developed in 1998 to uh, facilitate and enhance the exchange of credible research for fire and fuel between wildfire scientists and fire and fuel management managers. Um, this is one of the few programs in the country one of the few grant programs and funding programs that bases its funding and funding topics and lines of work on what managers on the ground and practitioners say they need more science on. So uh, the fire science networks and exchanges exist to uh, get to know people working on the ground, to get to know regional scientists, researchers, managers, practitioners, and bring them together to start talking the common language about wildfire management. Um, if you'd like to find out more about the resources through Joint Fire Science Program, uh, there's the website on the top, firescience.gov, and there's a wealth of information there that is useful to a lot of people. Um, the bottom line uh, is we fund fire science research that is applicable to management. A uh, little bit about more about Joint Fire Science Program before we jump into our region. Um, the Joint Fire Science Program has an annual grant process, and this might interest some of you that uh, are looking for, <coughs> excuse me, research opportunities. Every year, the Joint Fire Science Program keeps a thumb on the pulse of what's going on nationally in terms of wildfire science research and practitioner management needs. And they develop a call for um, funding opportunity proposals uh, that come out usually in September. So by August, they've heard from a lot of the fire science exchanges, and their board develops a list of funding opportunities. Um, I believe that they have up to, I don't know, their budget just got readjusted through the federal budget this year, but I believe they have up to, it has been historically up to $8 million nationwide that they fund on fire science research. Anyone can apply. Um, there are certain uh, requirements for principal investigators and uh, academic backgrounds and management backgrounds, but they base these funding opportunities on management needs and pull out, put out research opportunities in September, uh, and then the funding opportunity proposals are due in November. So. Uh, keep an eye on those funding opportunities if you have research or a program, especially one that's interdisciplinary or between PhDs and managers that um, you think would enhance management in your area. Okay, so that brings us to just what the heck are the fire science networks. Um, so the Joint Fire Science Program started in, basically in 1998 in response to uh, concerns about mega fires that, <clears throat> excuse me, were recognized to be part of you know our future. We were always we, mega fires are not going to be going away, 
And someone in the federal government realized that uh, managers and scientists and researchers were not really talking to each other about needs and about applications. So the Joint Fire Science Program was born. And after about 10 years, they realized they needed a lot more boots on the ground and a lot more network building, a lot more face-to-face -face interactions with regional people. So they divided up the country into basic fire ecozones that are shown here. And you can see the Southern Rockies is in purple, my favorite color, fits well. And uh, we were basically sandwiched in between all the other ones. We have a wide variety of habitats, uh, including the um, pine country of the Black Hills and Pine Ridge in northwest Nebraska. Um, the boundaries of these fire science networks are very general. People go to the ones that they feel are serving their needs. And there's probably some of you out here that are saying, wait a minute, the Southern Rockies, doesn't that go all the way down into northern New Mexico and then just around Santa Fe and the Segundo Cristo Mountains? You're right, it does. Um, but since Arizona and New Mexico and a lot of management and federal agencies in Region 2 were uh, not Region 2, I forget what that region is federally. But uh, those two states work closely together as well as with the Navajo Nation. Um, that's more of a political boundary there. And uh, so we work closely with all our neighboring fire science networks. Um, I get questions about, well, who funds the Southern Rockies Fire Science Network? How does the money, uh, how's the money managed? What, how does this get started? The Southern Rocky, or the, um, all the exchanges, the Joint Fire Science Program is funded through a congressional appropriation out of Washington, D.C., and is um, handed to the BLM, the National Interagency Fire Center in Boise, that manages as a flow through nationwide. And from there, the money is distributed nationwide to a variety of universities and uh, agency centers that apply for this program. So every three years, um, this is grant driven, and we have to show what we've been doing. We're required to submit annual reports, and we just submitted our renewal for our next three years, um, February 19th. So wish us luck, and <laughs> I'm looking forward to another three years of uh, doing this and getting to know everybody. So if you have any more questions about funding and how the money is managed, um, just contact me or post a question. And moving along, this is a map that shows a little bit better our region and how diverse it is. Those of you who know the Southern Rockies general region understand that this encompasses um, a wide variety of habitats, all the way from central Utah, um, the Fish Lake and Dixie National Forest, the southern half of Wyoming, which we finally know is the Sagebrush Sea, and Intermountain Colorado, all the way to where I'm standing now in Fort Collins, where the um, Rockies meet the Great Plains. We also help to do outreach and fire science exchange in the Black Hills area of South Dakota and Northwest Nebraska. Um, we have an agreement with the Great Plains that we handle the, the pines and they handle the grass. Uh, there's a lot of areas in there where there's a lot of crossover issues between um, changing fuels, ladder fuels, invasives, livestock management, fuels and grazing underneath conifers, and, and fire behavior in those areas. So we work closely with the Great Plains to answer um, fire science needs up there as well. And you can see on the right, there's a list of habitat types, all the way from subalpine, lodgepole, down to grassland sagebrush, and pinyon juniper. Um, so to accomplish, to meet these needs and to plan our curriculum and our programming and our outreach and activities, our board and staff has identified regional issues that are shared generally across our five, five state region. And this helps to guide our program, programming of out, events, outreach, and science delivery tools. And we just had our annual meeting, and we've kind of uh, refined these to major topic areas and brought them up to date. Uh, and they include, as you can see, fire adapted communities and fire response, the WUI, uh, smoke and air quality, 
uh, fuels management and effectiveness, which includes uh, fuel on the ground fuels treatment with chipping and mastication and prescribed fire, um, sagebrush and fire, um, landscape restoration and resilience in response to uh, climate change, and of course fire ecology, post-fire ecology, watershed health, restoration, and those topics. So pretty much um, these main regional topics are germane to uh, most areas in our region, and most of our activities fall under one of these categories. So, well, you're probably thinking, oh gosh, another acronym, another government grant funded agency? Don't we already have some people doing this stuff? Well, I wanted to point out a couple things that make Surfson unique and why we are doing what we're doing. Uh, we've kind of coined the term since we have a wide variety of people spanning a large area and a wide variety of habitat types and issues. Uh, we adapt to the gaps in wildfire knowledge, and that requires us to be pretty flexible in terms of how we're, how we're meeting people's needs at the moment. Uh, we are the only organization that I'm aware of that crosses state and agency boundaries as well as private sectors and communities to increase wildfire knowledge and regional research. Uh, we're working to provide the latest credible information on what science is saying about wildfire-related issues. We're flexible enough to respond to both regional and local and community needs. And just a clarification, what we're not is we're not the same program as fire-adapted communities or FireWise. Um, we help to work with those groups. We help to provide speakers, information, uh, research publications, online tools. But we're not in the business of telling you how to do your defensible space. We're in the business of bringing you the latest research about what science is saying about ignition, um, wildfire behavior spread in different fuels, and uh, what we're learning about the WUI. Um, and I also want to clarify latest credible information. Sometimes I get feedback from people, uh, scientists and researchers, that ask us to do extensive background research on other people's research and make sure that we're posting only the right science. Um, we do our best with that based on who we know, our background, and what we know about uh, wildfire in the region. However, you know, we're not vastly staffed and we don't run a separate research department. So we're not really in the business of calling the shots of whose research we think is right and whose research we think is wrong. So that's, that's just some feedback I've gotten. Real quick, our service and outreach continues to grow. Our listserv is now up to, as of today, 675 members across portions of five states. We also have people following us in Australia, Canada, a little bit in Europe, um, and Alaska. Uh, we have a Twitter account up to 656 followers. Uh, we're following 258 accounts. If you know of one we're not on, we want to know about it. And I'm sure we've got more tweets than that now. Um, so what does that number say? Who's signing up? Um, this is a graph that shows our growth through time. Uh, basically, Southern Rockies Fire Science Network started in 2012 at the Nature Conservancy in Boulder, and it was very part-time. It had a very part-time co coordinator and a part-time PI, and um, Needless to say, they, they really grew a lot, and when they hired a full-time coordinator and expanded our board, uh, we could take on a lot more capacity, take on a lot more outreach. So you can see uh, from 2012 to 2015, certain areas have grown quite a bit. As you would expect, our largest um, members, followers, are between federal agencies and researchers and scientists and universities. However, I wanted to point out um, between local government, we have a significant following on the local level, municipalities, uh, local governments, um, fire departments, that kind, those kind of people are uh, very interested and growing. Um, our private, private interest, uh, this would be private companies, consulting firms, private landowners, as well as an, other groups that um, may not show up in these other categories, like media, reporters, um, consultants, and those other groups. 
So we're gaining on the feds and the university researchers. <laughs> but I'd like to see uh, this diversified a lot more, as well as these numbers. Um, you can see, since we're based in Fort Collins in Colorado, um, and this is where we have a lot of wooey issues. We have some of the most major wildfires happening in this area. Um, we have a lot of established universities and facilities. The Rocky Mountain Research Station, the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute, um, a lot of outreach and, and activity with the Colorado State Forest Service, as well as other groups. Uh, our involvement in Colorado continues to climb. But this chart is a call for help and involvement from all of you. Um, you can see that the numbers are a little bigger in some of other states. South Dakota, our board member in South Dakota is really proud of those numbers. <laughs> Utah and Wyoming, um, really looking forward to more outreach with their state forestry and extension agencies there. And this is one reason why Jamie and I and Outreach Division and Colorado State Forest Service really wanted to take time to get some outreach with you guys. Um, as you learn more about us, you can tell your friends in these other agencies and these other areas and help us network because um, you're part of what we're doing as well. How are we doing this? <clears throat> Several ways. Uh, definitely online information. We are continuing to expand our social media. We just have a new website, which I'll talk about later. Um, we try to post as much wildfire research, events, and news in a variety of ways. Regionally relevant fire science documents and publications. So hopefully we get to a point where people don't have to, to wade through piles of irrelevant stuff and we can focus more on resources in the, resources in the region. Uh, we're working on online tools that help get to the point of research or projects so you don't have to uh, spend a couple hours going through scientific papers. Uh, we have a series that I'll get into a little bit of five minute um, presentations that summarize research or projects that you can use as well as um, other social medias, e-news and Twitter and Facebook and stuff. So, Partnerships and networking, there on the right, uh, that almost goes without saying, but it shouldn't. Um, partnerships and networking, you can't replace it. It's through that that we identify regional fire knowledge needs. And I say fire knowledge instead of science a lot, because it's a nod to people who are, aren't PhDs or that aren't out there uh, doing just research to publish a paper. Uh, the knowledge on the ground has a lot to do with how we manage our forests. And Southern Rockies Fire Science Network is a place for that as well. Um, the main thing I want to emphasize here is face-to-face -face events. As I said before, we're really blessed to have a lot of uh, scientific resources here in our region. Rocky Mountain Research Station, Colorado State, UC Boulder. Um, various community colleges have wildlife and wildfire and forestry programs. Um, there's no shortage of uh, a lot of print about a lot of these issues. What we're working on doing is getting people out of the offices more often, away from the screens more often, getting to talk to each other about fostering solutions and um, coming and working together on problem solving. Um, to, this is a couple of examples I wanted to highlight. This is a project that's kind of been ongoing. Some of you re may remember back in 2012, there was a small but smaller but significant event in near Pagosa Springs in southern Colorado, the Little Sand Fire of 2012, which burned up about 25,000 acres. And in response, the people in Pagosa Springs in the area uh, took this as a warning and wanted to uh, get some education and discuss what they, misunderstandings and questions they had about how the fire was managed. Was it supposed to be suppressed? Was it supposed to uh, let be let burn? Why did the foresters do what they were doing? And how can we prepare for the inevitable next fire? 
um, our objective, well, we were called in to help facilitate a workshop with this, and our objective was to answer questions about the fires and decision-making process and to bring some science to inform the local dialogue um, and hopefully to build more understanding and trust about wildfire management issues. So, so we brought in this guy on the upper right. That's uh, John Taylor. He's an active rancher in the area. I had a lot of stories. And the lady to the left is uh, an, also a ranch owner. And they shared their stories about how the fire impacted them and their businesses and the watersheds. The center picture is a shot of the Little Sand Fire. Um, shot at the bottom is a scientist, Dr. Peter Brown, we brought in, who shared his research about fire history in the region to inform people about what we're looking at in terms of fire intervals and behavior. Uh, and we took it on the road. We went up to the Little Sand Fire. We stopped and talked to this gentleman who ran a resort up in the mountains uh, and talked about how he learned about dealing with wildfire and tourists and his resources on his re resort. A lot of people um, really learned the challenges that he faced. and he became he came to understand more about wildfire management. Uh, we went up to the burn itself, and Dr. Brown is showing people how we understand more about fire history with uh, tree cores. And while we were standing in this spot, if you could look to the east, you can see the West Fork fire blowing up that day. So there were a lot of jokes about we would be back in two years and doing the same thing. And they were right. Um, so the West Fork fire became the West Fork complex of 2013 and um, affected 109,000 acres, more or less. Um, it was a remarkable fire down there. You can see the upper right photo. That photo was taken by the Pikes, Pikes Hot Shots, I believe. And as we're going to see in, the minute, in a minute, the, um, the continuous dead standing fine fuels, ground to crown fine fuels of beetle kill spruce just had fire behavior and smoke behavior that was off the charts. Um, we, were dry, we were leaving the little sand workshop and I drove out underneath this plume and we were some of the last people through the gate at 160, on Highway 160 before they closed it. So it was just a phenomenal fire. Um, and I would like to illustrate here um, you should all have up on your screens this video, and we're going to try to play just a snippet of this for you, because I want to emphasize this was given to us through the Department of Fire Suppression, Fire Prevention and Control here in Colorado. And I want to share this with you. Uh, if, um, so I'm going to play a snippet of this for you. It's a helicopter flyover at the Continental Divide, and it shows the spotting behavior in these extreme fuels. And yes, all those trees are dead, uh, and you can see how this is acting. And I believe Affirmative, it's uh, from uh, that Trout Lake south is where it's going to hit. Just south of Trout and Williams Lake, just south of it. Okay, I copy. Let's go ahead and give me a, well, hang on one second, boys. It's, sure. it's venturing to run into its own uh, tail where the point of origin was. I'm too busy on the screen right now, man. And it is uh, July 3rd, 2013, and you're looking at the Papoose uh, fire run that is occurring out of Division Juliet. There's the coordinates of uh, well, kind of where it came around in Juliet, right there. we are a couple years later uh, hosting a, a larger and even more extensive workshop with communities of South Fork and Creed and Pagosa Springs as well as people from Durango came all the way over and we brought together um, district personnel, scientists, different agencies. The, this is in the, um, what do you call it, the lodge of uh, Wolf, Wolf Creek Ski Area which uh, fortunately was saved from the fire. Um, brought together a lot of people to talk about what made this fire different and special. 
which there was different weather patterns acting at the time in that, in that area regionally in the United States that kept that high pressure system right there uh, for a while. So the federal agencies really had to pull people nationwide and even from Canada to help out with fire modeling and behavior. And, um, and there were also some fascinating um, nonprofits that resulted from this. Uh, we also combined with uh, the next day with field tours, hydrologists, and other people who shared their effects on the fire. Um, so to discuss other ways that we're working to help adapt to the gaps, uh, we help to facilitate. These are examples that I'm giving to you to help you think about ways that, that we can work together with your projects. We help to work with uh, Project Learning Tree to host the Fire Ecology Institute this last summer. Um, we, have, we help to facilitate uh, experts and other agency people and Utah State Forestry Extension to display their mobile paralysis unit that really goes a long way in talking about the latest technology with um, managing um, byproducts in the woods. Uh, of course, we're uh, a major sponsor and supporter of the Colorado Wildland Fire Conference. And we also uh, are helping in Shadron in northwest Nebraska and all people in South Dakota um, to help facilitate their Shadron Forestry Day, where we talked about um, their three-pronged approach to helping grow fire-tolerant forests. Uh, this is a brief, I hope this works, I don't know, but if it doesn't, we'll have to go back later. This is a 30-second spot that we developed to highlight the technology of the mobile paralysis unit to help people um, manage, have an alternative to managing fuel in the woods. So let's give this a try. Our goal is to process woody biomass. And the idea is that wood is mostly air and water. It's really hard to haul. You can't afford to bring it out of the woods. So we bring this machine into the woods and we can pr process this material in the woods and haul out these higher value products. Pyrolysis is not burning the wood. It's not open combustion. It's cooking the wood in the absence of oxygen. Introduce you to this really cool new uh, pyrolysis technology. One of the major issues with um, dealing with chips and byproduct in the woods is, is leaving it there. Now we, have, we haven't really removed anything. We've changed it and distributed it, and now it's acting different and posing safety issues as well as other management issues to firefighters and managers. Uh, the Utah, Utah State University has partnered with Amaron Energy of Salt Lake City to develop a pyrolysis unit that cooks these fuels in the absence of oxygen which gives off um, like a, um, a pellet resource for fuel as well as a oil byproduct. So uh, it's a mobile unit that um, doesn't require any trucking and reduces the amount of stuff that comes out of the woods. So this is another example of how we're working with extension and managers and science. OK, so on to. Uh, a couple of what I call knowledge, knowledge tools to respond to regional issues. Uh, Gamble Oak, that, you know, there's lots of, let me back up a little bit. There's no shortage of information about ponderosa in fuels and fire management. There's probably no shortage of information about lodgepole pine, mountain pine beetle, and fire effects, and hydrology and that stuff. But there's not a heck of a lot of studies on gamble oak and mountain shrub um, information, science, and post-fire management. And gamble oak and mountain shrubs, as you can see, um, this is the most recent map that we could find. And this is, I think, from the US Geological Survey back in the 70s. Um, these green areas show presence absence of gamble oak within these counties. So Gamble Oak is pretty ubiquitous throughout our area. It also uh, is highly variable in its growth habitat. And I kid you not, that picture is Gamble Oak 
in um, so southwestern Utah. <laughs> Some extension guys found all the way down there. Um, and that's the size of those, those guys. Unbelievable. Um, but we know, people in the, you know, in the woods know that gamble oak is a vigorous re-sprouter after fire, post-fire. Uh, and sometimes it's sprouting behavior and causes and management is not well understood. And it presents a lot of different management issues. So we have in final review right now a gamble oak assessment project where we had a fire ecologist meet with managers all through our region where gamble is significant in Utah and western Colorado and Colorado Springs and interviewed managers that deal with this a lot and refined their issues, which were pretty similar across the board. And we are producing a document, a white paper, that we can use to assess the status of what we know. What is generally known in terms of science and on the ground about managing um, gamble oak pre and post fire. And when we get that out, hopefully by the end of this month or definitely by April, uh, that can go out region wide <clears throat> and be a basis for future workshops and presentations and hopefully future science. And ultimately, we'd like to have a funding opportunity notice from the Joint Fire Science Program to fund more research on gamble oak that managers can use. Okay, and our second, um, what I like to call as a knowledge tool, is addressing fuels treatment in the woods, which means mastication, chipping, lop and scatter, burn piles, and prescribed fire. This, these issues, no matter where I go in our region, people are pretty willing to share that they need information on how to handle this stuff that's left in the woods. And most of you guys know that photo all the way down there on the right is a chip pile. Um, there's no shortage of this in Colorado. Um, here, I had a little, whoops, little section here. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we're partnering with the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute and to generate a paper that will be a pilot project about best management practices for handling uh, fuels treatment on the front range of Colorado. Um, this is a document that will be produced through the Front, ra front Range Roundtable and uh, we'll discuss issues that regional managers identified as a critical need, critical needs. We're hoping that this document will provide land managers with uh, planning support and processes that's based on recent science to help you make informed decisions about fuels treatment projects. So you have some science to help you make sound decisions on what kind of methods to use for uh, treating fuels and do you want to chip, do you want to masticate, what, what are the objectives and choices with all of those. One of the main issues we have that's driving this, whoops, is uh, wildfire safety. Uh, wild firefighters come to me and, you know, this is no news to a lot of you, notice a lot of uh, weird and bizarre and unpredictable things that happen with fire in chips and masticated layers. Um, so this is one major reason why we're hoping to do this, to provide information for uh, management <clears throat> to increase wildfire or firefighter safety. <clears throat> so our social media strategies and our new website, southernrockiesfirescience.org. <clears throat> you can go there and see uh, we have highlights, recent activities, upcoming events and webinars. Uh, we're also developing a special area just on our website for fuels management and effectiveness. So we'll have a one-stop shop hopefully in the future um, for people to, to use for helping making decisions. And anything you have that you would like to contribute and like to see on this website, please let us know main thing you probably want to know about is options for funding. So upper on that, the upper right tab is our funding tab. <clears throat> and if you go to that, that page, it outlines ways in which we are trying, working to help with um, fire science exchange. Basically informational, logistical, or financial support. 
and there's a PDF that you fill out. You can choose, well, I want help with an online product, uh, I want help with a workshop or a field trip, or I want help with you know, other options. And you fill out the PDF, so we have kind of a thought through plan and identified needs of what you need from us. And then we can go over it and assess what we can do or if it's within our scope or how we can help you. So that's a key page and point in the webinar today. <laughs> so I bet I'll be hearing from some people about that. Um, I should note that, as I mentioned before, we just turned in our uh, renewal proposal on February 19th, and we're looking at a pretty full three years already. So if you have some projects, I kind of want to emphasize that during the winter months is our important planning period. So if you want to, if you have a project or an activity or a need that you want us to partner with, now's the time to get it to me before we're all in the field season, the wildfire season in the summer. Um, we also have an e-news there on the right that goes out as soon as we can get it out. Like I said, um, we can get overwhelmed sometimes. We have a small staff working for us. But this is one way we've found the best way to pull together regional issues and information, and news, and you know some fun and interesting stuff and share it with everybody. Um, online products also include hotspots and short videos. The hotspots are really, we work to get really to the point narrated PowerPoints or videos that are developed by the scientist or project manager and they have a topic that they want to share. And you can see some of you have already hopefully seen the characteristics of Colorado's forestry contractors. That was research done through Colorado State Forest Service and the Colorado Wood Utilization Unit. Um, that was research done by Damon Vaughn here in the Department of Forestry. And I felt uh, you know, that was a good opportunity to get out research. And we have a what we call a hotspot, which is a maximum of 10 slides or less. And um, the main points of the research are given in five minutes or less. And after, if after watching the hotspot, you need more information, um, you have a contact list and links at the end and can get more information about, about that topic. This series is really taking off. Uh, we just posted one yesterday um, using real-time technology, or I can't remember the whole title. Um, it's military technology, using military technologies to help track uh, firefight, firefighters and resources. Um, so that was just released yesterday, and it was picked up by Wildfire today. So we have three, at least three more hotspots in development in the pipeline. And if you have a project or success story particularly, you want to share about fuels treatment or working with people or research on the ground, Gamble Oak uh, or Prescribed Fire, we'd love to have you in our hotspot series. Um, we also are working on our Benefits and Barriers to Prescribe Fire video series. This is a series of short videos that highlight uh, how managers have used prescribed fire uh, to achieve management objectives and how they've overcome their um, obstacles and made it a success. There's two other community-based videos that are coming out. Uh, we'll have a Shadron Forestry video series that talks about uh, grazing and roads and thinning uh, applied to fire tolerant forests. And we'll also have a short video on the West Fork fire, um, how communities responded to water, their watershed post-fire. Upcoming programs. Um, we'll continue to support the Colorado Wildland Fire Conference as well as other regional events and conferences. Look for more field trips, workshops, demonstrations, and person-to-person -person events. We'll continue with our short videos, hotspots, and online learning tools. Uh, continuing to develop our website. Face-to-face, um, -face, like I said before, you just can't beat it. Uh, we'll also have proposed in this upcoming grant period to support a coordinator, uh, do partial support of a coordinator for the Colorado Prescribed Fire Council um, to help them 
have a coordinator that can just work to pull together uh, different agencies and interested parties and stakeholders and develop programs and activities um, to explore and educate about prescribed fires and management tool in our state as well as neighboring states. And we'll continue to work on papers in the next grant period, Gamble Oak, Fuels Treatments, Fire Ecology, and Bark Beetles. So what does this mean to you? I bet I can hear the cogs turning already out there about how we can work together with extension agents and state foresters. Again, this is my pitch, my selfless plug to encourage everyone to contact people you know in other agencies, especially the Federal Forest Service, agent, uh, Federal Forest, National Forest in our region, as well as all the extension agents you know that are in our region. Tell them about us. Let them know us. Let them know what we're doing. Um, if it's a project or a need that they have that involves wildfire science, that's where we belong. Um, like I said, I'm the only full-time person for portions of five states. I have a board that's very active and involved, and I have a few student uh, assistants, and also the support of the Colorado State Forest Service. Um, so it's it's not so much our office does everything, but that we are supporting our network to do as much as possible. Uh, so this is a list of things that I'm seeing we can participate with. Uh, if you have articles, projects, especially photos, links and videos for our website and our social media, please submit it. Uh, ideas, uh, success stories, and other, especially ideas you have for education, and activities to support sound management decisions and changes in policy. That's great. Here's our key takeaways. And um, you can look at some of these later for our links. SouthernRockiesFireScience.org. Follow us on Twitter. Um, here's the people who are involved in our board, plus a technical advisory team that helps with feedback and direction. And we have a few moments for questions. Just a minute, we have to get the, I'm hoping everybody's uh, can still hear us. Is the front range mulching guidelines you were talking about the one? Um, since Brett is the coordinator mostly for um, Colorado, front, Colorado Forest Restoration Institute, um, he's not really in a position to dedicate all his time to developing and writing it. So Southern Rockies Fire Science Network uh, is contributing the time of a um, postgraduate student, somebody who's just gotten their master's degree, who is also um, somebody very experienced in firefighting, just got his master's in um, natural resource management, and in his 10 years experience as smoke jumper. So and has personal experience with fire and, and the fuels treatments on the ground. So they're working together to um, refine the document, and it's in the final stages of development. So I'm thinking we're going to see that pretty soon, too. But again, everybody, I want to emphasize that what you're going to see with that, we had to make it manageable. They couldn't really take on fuels treatment statewide at this point, or region-wide. So there may be information in there that you think, well, I'm not sure about that on the Western Slope, or you know, down in um, Alamosa or something. This is a pilot project for this one area, and we're hoping to build on it and let it grow in the future. Other questions, comments? Yay, please type. Again, I want to thank everybody for spending time, and I hope we have a lot of good contributions and ideas.